Thank you everyone for uh, coming today to Tuesday Tea. I'm excited about this opportunity to have a couple representatives from Guide Dogs for the Blind. I think Guide Dogs is an amazing resource that we have to be knowledgeable about and know about as uh, TVIs and O&M providers both. Um, we have to be aware because the question about whether a guide dog is right for me um, seems to come up in 100% of our students and questions. And now that service animals have become even more so uh, across domains beyond just uh, guide dogs, we hear this question coming from parents and kids at all levels. And so the more that we can arm ourselves with information, um, as direct vision service providers, I think the better equipped we are to meet the needs of our students and the questions coming from them and their parents and the better we're able to help them prepare um, to make a decision between something like a cane or a canine. Uh, so thank you again, Mark and Angela, both for coming today and the floor is yours. All right, well, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Mark Gillard and I'm the Orientation and Mobility Services Manager over here at Guide Dogs. I am a comms and a Guide Dog Mobility Instructor as well. And uh, I've been in the field both here in Australia for coming on 29 years now, so I'm getting up there. And I'm really thrilled to be with you again because as Adrian alluded to just a few minutes ago, uh, Guide Dogs and CSB, uh, formed a really great partnership with a summer program with Shelby Zimmerman and the o &M team, uh, which we ran twice. And we put through 11 kids, I believe, through that program. And it was a lot of fun and really, I uh, got to hand it to Shelby and the team, very unique. And we really are excited Shelby's back and we'd love to continue that. Um, so before I go on, we were going to be joined today by our youth outreach specialist. Her name's Jane Flower, probably known to a lot of you. Jane had to pull out the last minute because she's not feeling well. So apologies from Jane, but um, I'm definitely gonna bring her side of the presentation to you this afternoon. She's told me exactly what I need to say. <laughs> so I hope I do a good job for her. Um, but at the last minute, we were able to uh, get another staff member who I'd like to introduce and she can tell you a bit about herself. And that is my fantastic new colleague in O&M Services, Angela Smith. Go ahead, Angela. Hi everyone, I'm Angela. I'm an orientation and mobility specialist and I help run the OMI program at Guide Dogs for the Blind. I've been there for about a year and before that I was in New Jersey on the other side of the country uh, at the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired uh, where I was an OM specialist as well. So thank you Angela. So um, I did send some links and some materials uh, before today's presentation. And uh, I just want to let you know before I get into it, we're going to be talking about how to determine readiness for guide dog mobility. And what we've decided to do is to talk about three categories uh, of readiness. Uh, there is a readiness checklist that encompasses, I think, nine categories um, that we have got on our website and you have a link to that in the materials. And it certainly is more broad than what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, we, we thought just talking about children and youth, we should focus on three of the areas. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. There it is. Um, the, the checklist, we designed it to assist orientation, mobility specialists, blindness professionals, um, clients and their families really delve into what it takes to be ready for a guide dog. There's far more uh, involved than you would think. Uh, definitely orientation mobility is really, really important, of course, but we're gonna talk about a bunch of other stuff, um, which you'll see all connects into someone's understanding of are they ready for this major lifestyle decision? When it comes to youth and children, uh, of course, we need to assist them with their decision-making process because they really haven't lived a lot of life to kind of work out how a dog might influence not just their life now, but maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years into the future, because that's the average working life that uh, we have with a guide dog. So, you know, if we think about a, a young person who might be 15, 16, 17, thinking about a guide dog, they've got to be thinking what they're going to be doing when they're 25, 26, 27. So uh, part of our role as uh, educators is to assist uh, these young folks with projecting into the future to make the right decision for themselves. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So I'm gonna 
screen share here and bring up uh, these PowerPoint slides. Okay. Everyone see that slide okay? Readiness categories? Yep. Good. All right, so I'm gonna run through the categories uh, that are in that broad checklist that you're free to use. But we are gonna talk about this first one, motivational readiness. And uh, that's gonna be all about, well, is someone applying for a guide dog for the right reasons? So we'll talk about that. Uh, secondly, psychological, cognitive and emotional readiness, very important for a young person. Physical, we're not gonna get into today, but clearly, uh, someone has to have the physical ability to work with a guide dog. Uh, I'll just go back. That one's important also for people who are uh, elderly or have multiple disabilities. So <clears throat> the checklist definitely goes into detail what's involved with that category. And I should say these categories are broken down further in the checklist to indicators of readiness, which we'll talk about. So these are the broad categories underneath are, are multiple readiness indicators you can use. Environmental readiness, which encompasses orientation, mobility and, and routes, so route knowledge um, and the basic uh, O&M building blocks uh, that everyone needs to have. So cardinal directions, time distance estimation, concept development, all that sort of stuff. Sensory. <clears throat> Just really quick on that one, um, one of the major eligibility criteria of our program is someone needs to be legally blind in both eyes. They also need to have the ability to make safe independent street crossing decisions using either residual vision, hearing, or a combination of both. So if it is you're working with some kids that are, are deaf blind or don't have the ability to make independent street crossing decisions, then there are other programs that actually train people that are deaf blind. Um, it's a specialty area within the guide dog world. One of those programs is over in Michigan and you can refer uh, people to leader dogs in Michigan. So that's a little bit about uh, dual sensory loss for you, but we have plenty of people that do have hearing impairment and vision impairment. Uh, many people with Usher's syndrome, for example. So certainly they are not ineligible for our program, but we do have that criteria of making safe, independent street, street crossing decisions. <clears throat> Accommodation and dog care. This one, I guess, is important for everybody, but when you're talking about a, 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 a kid, young person who might live at home with mum and dad, we obviously need the environment to be safe, hygienic, and suitable for placing a dog. Um, so, Again, checklist can go into more details and that does also include other pets. So behavior of other dogs in the household, things like that. This one really doesn't come into it, adult learning. Um, our program is based very much on the learner being in the middle of their program, uh, their own goals within the broader scope of what it takes to use a guide dog. Um, once again, training someone who is um, a youth, a child, we'll talk about things related to their learning readiness in the, in the presentation, but it would operate a little bit differently than a pure adult learning environment. We will talk all about this one, social readiness related to guide dog mobility. This is a huge area to, uh, to determine if a young person is ready to have a guide dog. Um, and I won't go any further, but very, very important. And dog knowledge, which is for everyone, uh, just to know a few things about dogs. I'll, I'll quickly say that part of Canes to Canines with Shelby and the team, which was so good, is that we're able to introduce the kids to dogs. We did a lot of things with grooming, brushing teeth, cleaning ears, um, doing a little bit of heel work with the dog on the leash and just spending time with dogs. So um, whilst you know having a dog is definitely not a mandatory prerequisite, it definitely helps particularly with congenitally blind kids to have them understanding what a dog actually is. Where's the mouth? Where's the tail? What do the paws do? You know, they're not gonna get bitten. Uh, you're gonna get slobbered on, you know, all this kind of stuff is really important for kids. So they're the categories. So starting off with the first one, motivation. The first indicator we're looking for is, are they motivated primarily by the goal of achieving independent mobility with a guide dog? And 
this is important because sometimes there's a little bit of a myth attached to why people would do well with a guide dog. One of the first uh, reasons people sometimes think about a dog isn't mobility at all. It could be companionship. So that's certainly one of the huge benefits of working with a guide dog, but it shouldn't be the primary one. So if we have a young person say, you know, I'm lonely, I'd really like a dog in my life, um, you know, would help me a lot. And, and certainly that's val valuable. Um, but if we don't hear anything about their mobility objectives, like wanting to go places, that's a bit of a concern because that's not what the dog is, is bred for. If it is that they're purely after companionship, there are plenty of emotional support animals out there. Um, doesn't have to be a dog. It could be a cat, could be a bird, who knows what. Emotional support animals are definitely legitimate and have a place in, in people's lives. But certainly guide dog, not primarily for companionship. Another thing that's often said, I want a guide dog because I feel vulnerable. I want a dog to protect me. Once again, that is not part of what a guide dog's all about. And in fact, any demonstration of aggression by a guide dog would result in the dog being permanently withdrawn and retired from service. So if someone's thinking about a dog will protect me or a, a parent thinks I want my son or daughter to have a guide dog because it will protect them, that's not uh, what it's about. We would need to counsel the people to understand that these dogs are so mellow and placid and the reason they are is because they can legally go into any public place. The last thing we can have is a dog showing any aggression. So what we're looking for is this independent mobility. We want to hear from the young person. Well, I want to get around school better. I want to go places. I want to, you know, I want to expand my horizons. Um, so definitely independent mobility is key. Second one under motivation, someone has to be really ready for a major commitment in order to be successful. And what do we mean by major commitment? Well, first of all, we're looking at what you really put into the relationship is what you're gonna get out. I like to use the analogy of a marriage, which is controversial, but certainly what you put into any relationship is what you're gonna get out. So um, there are some pretty basic things about working with a dog and, and having a guide dog, which we'll talk about, you know, the basic feeding and watering and grooming and vet care and all that sort of stuff. But it's also being with the dog in situations out there in the community where the dog is going to one day make a mistake and then another day the client or, or handler might make a mistake. And it's like working with each other to overcome problems. It's really about teamwork. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. And that's a very important thing to pass on to a young person and their family. Don't think for a minute that guide dog mobility is the answer to long cane mobility because it's perfect. It never goes wrong. That's not what it's about. Um, and sometimes we use the, use the phrase in this work just because a guide dog might go a bit faster and that doesn't necessarily mean compared to the cane, it's more efficient because it can also get you in trouble faster. <laughs> so there is a downside to it as well. So are they prepared to play their role in the person guide dog relationship to be a successful team? So this is just extending what I was saying. Got a picture there of someone uh, petting their dog and there's a food bowl. So definitely the handler is responsible for the daily care of the dog. And when it comes to a child, um, I'll give you an idea. I've got a 12 year old son and uh, I was always, and I still am at him to have you fed the dog? Have you picked up after the dog? Always. And uh, he's at me to get another pet. And it's like, we can't even look after this one. So this is a situation that a kid needs to be ready. This is their job, not mum or dad's, not brother, sister. No, it's actually their responsibility. And uh, with feeding with a guide dog at our program, it happens twice a day as well. And then they have to be bothered to get out of bed because you've got to keep the dog on a schedule. So they might have, maybe they're tired or it's cold and they don't want to get out of bed to feed the dog at seven o'clock whatever it might be. Well, that's gonna be a problem because if they delay the feeding till 9.30 when they feel like getting up, then the dog's rhythm is all thrown out and then you could have relieving accidents on a route, for example. So that gives you a practical example of, you know, playing their part, looking after that dog to be successful. 
picture here, a nice picture of a young man with his beautiful yellow lab looking up at him with love between them. And it's also important that part of this relationship is genuine affection for the dog. So um, the dog's not robotic. It's not going to do it for free. It has, it has to get something back. So definitely we need a, a young person to be committed and want to form a relationship. And, you know, that sometimes involves the next category. I'll talk about emotional readiness. If it is that a, um, a person has a problem forming relationships, it could be something in terms of their own uh, development. It could be a diagnosed condition. But if that's a problem, you know, they can't make attachments, then that can be problematic when it comes to bonding with a guide dog. But the flip side is true as well. And that is sometimes the dog can really bring people out of their shell and they can really help a young person, you know, develop affinity and affection and show that to a, to a dog. Sometimes it's safer to show it to an animal uh, than a human being, for example. And just another picture of a working guide dog team. Obviously, part of the role is the person must have the orientation mobility skills to be able to direct a dog through space. So the role of the handler is very much the navigator of the team. Another myth that people uh, get trapped by and misunderstand, parents included, is the dog will do it all. That is, I give my kid the dog, they say forward through the harness handle, find the bank or find school or find the lecture room or whatever it might be, the dog is just gonna do it. Clearly that's not what happens. The person needs to direct the dog. So they really are the navigator of the team. one's a biggie I've sort of talked about a little bit already does the client understand a guide dog requires 24 7 365 days a year care and there's a picture there of a very very young little baby it is like bringing a baby home um, we're feeding the dog twice per day we're grooming the dog we're taking it out to relieve itself on leash five times per day so almost like changing the diaper <laughs> so it's there's a lot that goes into it so if you have a young person who isn't yet caring for themselves then how are they going to care for something else so that gives you a bit of an idea that that 24 7 commitment it also lasts right throughout the dog's working career and beyond and i'll get to that in a second and this is where we're going long-term responsibility. Um, the average working life of a guide dog at the moment is around seven and a half years. So if they go out into the field when they're two, just under two, typically by the time they're nine and a half, 10 years of age, they're starting to slow down and maybe approaching retirement. Now the care doesn't stop when the dog stops working. Most uh, graduates uh, have the option of keeping their dog after the dog retires. So if you've got a dog that's retired at 10, it could go on for another three years and require care as an older dog. And there's special care that goes into it looking after an older dog, just like an older person. So that's what I mean. You're thinking about a 16 year old, thinking about a guide dog. Well, maybe by the time they're 26, the dog would retire. And maybe the time they're 29, the dog would leave the earth, so to speak. So they're, they're talking about a decade or more in terms of deciding whether this is the right thing for them. How about this one? Is the client positive about living with a guide dog when it's off duty and forming a long-term relationship? So if I was to sort of think about a pie chart and the wedges in the pie chart as a proportion over 24 hours, of how many hours a dog or guide dog is spent working, it's a fraction of 24 hours. Uh, a very busy team might work four hours a day. So they might get up, get the bus, go to college, go to work, whatever it is. It might be, might be an hour ride on the bus, something like that. Um, they'll get to work, dog will be under the desk or they'll get to college, dog will be in the lecture hall, whatever. They might get out again between classes or they'll take the dog out for a, a workout at lunchtime, and then they'll do it all over again to get back home. So a busy person might have four hours of actual guide work. What's the rest of the time? The rest of the time is sleeping, feeding, relieving, but also the dog just being a dog. 
So they need to be positive, and so does the family, positive about having a guide dog at home. The inside dogs, absolutely, they're inside, uh, and they just become a part of the family. And uh, for most uh, people, that's a positive, but there are some cultures, there are some family units, some individuals, regardless of culture, that maybe something like dog hair could be a problem. No, I don't want the dog inside. No, I have, you know, I don't want it on my clothes or, you know, and maybe there's legitimate allergies to dander uh, that's in dog hair. So, you know, living with a dog is a family decision, particularly if, you know, the young person is still living at home with their parents or, or uh, you know, caregiver. So before I go on to the, the second category, psychological, cognitive, emotional, um, Adrian, I don't know if I can uh, ask if anyone has any questions right now before I move on, if that's okay. Absolutely, uh, for sure. Um, anybody, welcome to unmute yourself and speak up, or if you throw your questions in the comments, I'm happy to read them off too. There, I, I interpret this as they, they want more. All right, good, good. <sighs> so I, we pick psychological, cognitive, and emotional when it comes to looking at a young person because uh, obviously we know that cognitively, emotionally, psychologically, you know, people don't mature in that capacity till their early 20s. So, you know, and then, of course, it's debatable whether some people mature at all. But, you know, in terms of typical childhood development, it's a long way to go, even into someone's 19, 20, 21. So what are we talking about here when it comes to a guide dog? Does the client have any cognitive challenges? Now, this is a big one. Um, a lot of O&Ms I've talked to in recent times have asked me, hey, Mark, how many CBI kids are you seeing coming through guide dogs? So those with cortical visual impairment. And I sort of say, well, not a whole lot. And they said, well, get ready. <laughs> um, so in terms of cognitive issues um, and comorbidities uh, when it comes to, um, to the brain and to neurological development, why this is important is because the person, first of all, in their training needs to be able to comprehend and remember things and then importantly apply those things over the long term independently. So it's all very well for a young person to go through a, in our case, it'd be a two week training program, having a guide dog instructor right there with them and maybe prompting them to carry out certain tasks or certain skills with the dog. But we're always evaluating what happens when we leave. Because if they don't have the ability to do those things by themselves, then we really do have a problem ranging from plain old inefficient travel right up to the worst case scenario of a safety risk. So, yeah, we really spend a lot of time in the assessment phase in particular, um, using simulated guide dog travel through the Juno exercise that you guys probably know about, simulating the guide dog with an empty harness. And we're really trying to duplicate as much as we can without having a real dog there to see what someone can do. Can they remember things? Can they apply things? Um, and really, when you think about it, they've got to do it pretty quickly. We have a two-week training program. We, we don't have a model, say, like uh, orientation center for the blind where you can stay for months and acquire skills over that time period. We have a two-week program, so it moves pretty fast. So, you know, looking at types of client groups, um, when we start talking about intellectual disabilities, to be honest with you, um, we apply our eligibility criteria equitably. We don't discriminate against types of vision impairment or, you know, other types of uh, conditions. But it's pretty rare that we see someone come through with an intellectual disability and be successful because of everything that I'm about to go into when it comes to the um, cognitive requirements. This is the main one. Will the client be able to process sensory input and make decisions quickly enough while multitasking? And sometimes it can just put clients that might have additional cognitive challenges, which could include memory, uh, could include comprehension, verbal comprehension. It can really be too much. 
And when you think about um, not only do they have to process input such as tactile input through their feet or through the harness handle, they've got to put together auditory input, traffic sounds, all those things that you guys know very well. Um, they've got to remain oriented themselves, so spatial awareness. They've got to monitor the dog's behavior and the dog's emotional state. And then they've got to uh, display leadership and decision making in order to show leadership to that dog in a variety of situations. That requires a lot of mental processing and also processing speed. So if they can't do all that as they're moving through space, then dogs being dogs are going to work out very quickly that this person really isn't up to it. And then they'll start to assert themselves and maybe things like distraction can increase, diving for food, going after other dogs, sniffing. Sometimes their guide work will deteriorate, like not stopping at curbs or stairs properly. And that can then go into a danger type situation. So, you know, some folks, there's no doubt about it, uh, are more suited to long cane travel than guide dog travel. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think in, in terms of our role as TBIs and O&Ms, you can use this checklist and you can go through the indicators to help them understand what is actually involved with this particular category um, to be ready and be successful with a dog. Emotional readiness. So are they emotionally stable? so they can form a long-term relationship with the guide dog and respond and attend to its physical and emotional needs. So there's a whole lot in that readiness uh, indicator there. Let's start with emotional stability. There's Danny Glover with a big smile, grin on his face. There's someone who's in some sort of state that I don't really know. So we've got a picture there of a woman who looks very upset. We've got a concerned gentleman there worrying about something and we have a very confused Weimaraner. So what this actually shows is that whilst all human beings have their emotions and ups and downs, if you have a condition that actually is um, difficult for a person to remain emotionally stable, that can really impact a dog in terms of the dog's behavior, stress level, reliability as a working guide dog, you name it, because there's such a symbiotic relationship between the handler and the dog, and the dogs are just so good at picking up the emotions from the handler. So what we mean is that if, if um doesn't matter if it's a young person or an adult, certain uh, diagnosed conditions like bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, those sorts of things, if they're not well controlled, then it can be problematic in terms of someone being ready to work with a dog. Um, other issues also in terms of responding and attending to the dog. The dogs are living, breeding creatures responding to their environment as they move through space. And that could be, for example, they're working through an area that has a high population of dogs, a lot of barking, snapping, aggressive dogs behind a fence. Let's just use that as an example. The person needs to be emotionally stable enough to be able to recognize my dog is stressed. It might be displaying behavior like whining or it might be pulling through the harness or maybe it's not wanting to walk and lead out. It's actually kind of freezing up. So the client needs to know that and then respond to the dog by providing support. So maybe changing their voice tone, maybe altering, uh, altering the route to avoid that circumstance perhaps, and maybe halt the dog and give it a pet or give it a piece of food reward to kind of, you know, help it navigate that stressful situation. So if we have someone who doesn't have that capacity, then that's a very, very important thing that could amount to the dog not feeling supported, contribute to an increase in stress and then affect its work and obviously its emotional state. The physical and emotional needs are also um, um, demonstrable by, for example, maybe the dog is laying down in a corner of the house and looks a bit depressed and someone might not have got their dog out for a week because of maybe they've got something going on with their own health. Maybe there's a family situation going on. So they need to always be monitoring how my dog is feeling. You know, oh boy, I better get it outside for a walk or I better play some tug. I, I better, you know, 
groom my dog, spend some time with my dog. So for a young person, you can see that having the capacity to kind of monitor their dog's emotional needs, that's a very mature thing we're asking them to do. We're asking them to think about someone other than themselves, right? Um, there's a category of uh, client that I can talk about because one of my sons has special needs. He's actually on the autism spectrum. And you guys at CSB might work with uh, kids who have autism as well as vision impairment. This is a big one for kids with autism. And that is, can they form an emotional connection? Can they actual, actually monitor and have that ability to provide support to something else? They might have the fantastic memories. They might have fantastic uh, O&M skills. But this kind of intangible can sometimes be difficult. But there's also a good side. Plenty of people on the autism spectrum have made great guide dog handlers because sometimes their, their ability to stick to a schedule and very methodical and do things by the book each day, that can really help a dog have that kind of uh, structure to its life. So there are, with that particular uh, diagnosis, a lot to consider there. And it obviously is gonna compare, uh, sorry, be determined by each individual, but definitely worth talking about because of the prevalence of autism now in kids and it's rising all the time. A very important one to be aware of, I think, for us as educators and talking to families. Okay, psychological, cognitive and emotional, we're talking now about maturity. And here's a lovely photo of a young girl there who is working an actual guide dog. And um, that dog is through the Mirror Guide Dog Foundation in Quebec, Canada. And it's a unique breed, especially uh, bred for working with young people. And it's actually a cross between a Bernese mountain dog and a Labrador. And the issue here is, and this is sometimes debatable, um, and you, know, you can get into some lively discussions about this. Just say this young lady had the best O&M skills in the world, like she was so well oriented. Great, but there's a basic question. Is, uh, the, is it the case that mom and dad are gonna be happy to let her out on her own and go work the dog? So, you know, we're talking about, is she mature enough to be out there on her own? Um, are mum and dad happy enough for that to happen? Does she live in a neighbourhood where that's not a good idea? So, you know, there are a lot of things that go into it, even though the kid might present as having all the skills that they need to have. Maturity also relates to all those things that I've just mentioned. You know, the ability to look after the dog, respond to its emotional needs, do that without prompting from mum and dad, be consistent about it. And also as someone, for example, progresses from maybe a high school setting as a senior and transitions into maybe vocational training or into a college environment, then they need to have the maturity to enter into that new phase of their life, but also still be there for their dog. And that could involve learning you know, new routes and destinations, could be at college learning obviously a whole bunch of new things when it comes to their academic uh, programs and also we'll talk about this in a moment the social environment so navigating a brand new environment at college with all the social opportunities that that might bring the guide dog still has to be number one um, the, and the young person can't get lost in the social environment and going to dorm parties or whatever it might be and forgetting that they have a dog that they need to look after that requires maturity to you know be that kind of organized individual so that social this is our last category before we open it up has the person discussed their guide or goal with their support and social network and there's a lovely picture there of one of our graduates with the photo with the family there at graduation and why this is so important is that a guide dog, particularly with a young person who most likely lives at home with parents, siblings, uh, you know, support people, the guide dog enters into that environment as a member of the family. So if, if someone is not on board, if dad or mom or a sibling is anti-dog or has social uh, relationship issues with the guide dog handler, 
no point bringing a dog home in that environment because the dog is going to pick up stress and it could also upset you know the family dynamic so discussion needs to take place with the family so everyone's on board all their questions are answered and all their concerns addressed before a guide dog would come home and we really assess that in a lot of detail but there's it's always good that O&M specialists, TBIs, you name it, who are already in this young person's world in their orbit, have this discussion, have it with the parents, have it with the family. It's often the case that you guys, as opposed to the guide dog school, have long standing relationships with these young folks as they come through CSB, for example. So you have the rapport that we don't. And you don't have to be a guide dog instructor to discuss this. Okay. So you're doing us a favor for sure. Um, also, looking at this category here when it comes to school, let's, let's just say CSB here. Um, very important that teachers are involved, the principal is involved, so that everyone in the school environment is aware of what's being discussed, what the potentials are, and that there is a supportive, understanding school community. I'll give you a few examples of how it can go horribly, horribly wrong. If we don't have teachers on board like the classroom teacher for example and a young person uh, has their summer break or spring break and then they turn up unannounced with their guide dog that can cause all sorts of problems <clears throat> i had one case that a teacher was allergic to dogs <clears throat> and took the uh, took her case to the teachers union and there were all sorts of problems in terms of who has rights under the ADA and who has workplace rights and how oh, it's all, it was a mess. And it could have been avoided if there was discussion beforehand. In terms of the student body, um, we've had situations where there hasn't been enough discussion with the principal and the, and, the, and the kids in the school to recognize that this is a special dog that's coming in. We don't disturb it when it's working. We don't pet it without permission. We don't try and feed it our lunch all that sort of stuff, all those basics needs to be addressed. So, you know, this young person who's still learning how to work their dog after two weeks of training, whatever it is, they don't go back to school and have to be handling all the, all these issues, potentially a multitude of issues when it comes to working in a, a quite busy school environment with a range of kids. So definitely that one is a huge one that gets people ready for the school environment in particular. This one's very important. Is the client prepared and capable of communicating with and directing others? Now, again, I'll give you a scenario. Back at CSB, just say um, an older student decided it was fun to interfere with uh, a working guide dog with a kid that was maybe a year or two younger than they were. What's gonna happen? Well, what needs to happen is this young guide dog handler needs to have the wherewithal to be able to communicate and look after their dog. Because if the older kid is successful in feeding the sandwich, and that can happen maybe a couple of days in a row, well, guess what? The dog's very quickly going to start to associate that person with getting fed or that actual area. It could be the lunchroom, cafeteria, a bench, anything the dog could associate that with food and that could interfere with its work. And of course, over the long term, and this has happened with adults plenty of times, the, if, the, if the dog's getting fed either with the knowledge of the handler, against their wishes, obviously, or without the knowledge of the handler, which happens a lot, so people sneaking food to the dog, then you can have weight gain, you can have obesity issues. And so therefore the dog's physical health really is affected by gaining weight. So it really is necessary for someone to have the confidence to be able to say, hey, listen, please do not feed my dog. This is what can happen. And if you don't stop, I'm going to direct it to my teacher or to the principal, or they're going to have to have almost like I would say a bullying strategy, a policy, where if they're feeling bullied, they know where to go, they know who to talk to, because their dog's health and behavior is at stake. Now, not every young person has that ability. It's simple as that. You might have a very shy person. There's no way they could stand up for themselves with that kind of situation. But 
This is partly why only a small number of, of kids in their teens, 15, 16, have the readiness to work a dog in a school environment or just in general out there in the environment because they have to stand up for the dog. You know, it's not easy to do at a young age. I've got a picture here of a golden retriever and we're looking down on it and there's a harness with a sign that says, do not pet me, I am working. And the indicator is, has the client addressed and resolved any issues? So here's another aspect which kind of ties into maturity. Um, just say they're in their family or at their school and, or a teacher and a teacher, you know, is, is giving the student problems. Like, I don't want that dog in my classroom. Or um, your dog, the way you treat that dog is I'm really, that, I'm not happy with that at all. The way you're using the leash looks really cruel to me. So the, these are things that might actually come up, even though the student might be doing everything right. So there's a lot of homework to be done and the, the person needs to have a structure in place that they can take any concerns or feelings that um, you know, they're being singled out by teachers even, or just a lack of understanding by teachers or staff or other students and resolve those things hopefully before they get there. But obviously, as things are progressing, as they work their dog through the years that they're at the school. No point sitting on these problems and not dealing with it until the time comes. That's the worst case scenario. When it comes to legal access, this is another really interesting area that, um, and I'm sure Adrian and the other uh, folks there know this better than I am, um, the different forms of legislation. I don't think in a school setting, the ADA is as applicable as the Rehabilitation Act. Would I be correct on that? I mean, there's all the same types of protections in a school. And I think uh, what you said earlier is the most important thing that I pulled from all of this, which is it's not about the law, it's about the communication up front. Mm -hmm. um, and when you surprise a school site with a dog, you surprise your gen ed teacher who's allergic to dogs with your dog one day, of course they're frustrated. Um, and so, being able to pull out a law out of your pocket and say, but uh, doesn't work with the relationship, right? Like it doesn't work with uh, what you actually need, which is support of your of your service animal. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm bringing in a true story here as well when it comes to the college environment. So we're talking about transition age youth, maybe going, you know, 17, 18, going into college. There was a a case that I was aware of that um, really exposed some of the the laws and some of the, the gray areas. Um, it is legal to ask a, a guide dog handler or any legitimate service dog user to register their dog with the department, sorry, the uh, Disabled Student Services Office, for example, at a college. And you don't have to do that in an ADA situation, like you don't have to register the dog going into a restaurant or in a movie theater, right? Don't have to do that. But the reason they can ask for that at a college is because the dog is not transient, right? The student is maybe going to be there for four years. So therefore, they're looking at it differently where the ADA, it is a transient situation. The dog goes in for two hours as someone eats dinner at a restaurant and then leaves. So it is important for those reasons as well. And this is where, again, communication is so important that the, if there are any legal questions by staff, faculty, principal, whatever it might be, that anything that involves legal um, stuff to, to get it out there and get it addressed. Um, so it's not a mess when the person comes back with the dog. And a 16 year old or whatever is obviously going to need some help with that. So once again, having teachers on board, principal, staff, et cetera, very, very important to help them navigate that. And just so you know, too, under the ADA, if it was, for example, that a teacher had a legitimate medical disability that was classified you know, as an allergy, but it was actually a medical proven disability, just because they have that doesn't mean the rights of the student are discounted. In fact, what would happen is both their rights are considered equal under the ADA, and then you'd have to have accommodations for both, which might involve a different teacher. Um, it might involve 
the dog being in a, a position in the classroom far enough away from the teacher not to cause a problem. So those are the sorts of things I'm getting at here when it comes to legal aspects of having a dog in a school or any other environment. And there it is, no dogs allowed except service animals. So an understanding of the law as well, just in regards to uh, guide dogs, service dogs are there to mitigate a disability. Obviously in our case, it's visual impairment or blindness and they are legally allowed in public places, including places of education. We, we have a couple of questions, Mark. I don't know if this is the time or if you want to, if you have an upcoming spot to pause. Well, let's see, I think yes, this would be a good spot. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have one that just came in to me, uh, just about that right there, but, and it says, but aren't there times where you just shouldn't take your dog? Does guide dogs have special circumstances they recommend to teenagers um, to not take their dog? And I, I know that this comes up on our campus of kids who hear about the ADA and they get all brazen. They're like, I can take my dog to a rock concert if I want to. Yeah. Um, no one can stop me. Um, I can fit my dog underneath that tiny little space in a in wherever if I want to. Uh, how do you guide kids and and uh, users on that issue of there's a time and place to take your dog and there's some places that might not be perfect? Thank you. That is such a great question. Thank you and very important. We use the phrase just because you can take your dog somewhere doesn't mean that you should. And, um, and you're absolutely right, you know, having this kind of power of, wow, I can do this, the law's on my side, you know, when you've got that underdeveloped teenage mind that, that can go haywire. Um, but we give examples of where it would be ethically the wrong decision to make. So absolutely loud rock concert, um, just because you can go there with your dog, that's not a good idea. You can have the dog under stress, you can even damage its hearing. Um, if you have sound that's high enough, obviously. Same thing with an environment that might have a lot of food in it. Is it a good idea to take your dog to a baseball game when there's peanut shells all over the ground and who knows what else? Uh, carnivals or fairs, just because your dog can get on a ride at Disneyland, does it mean you should take the dog on the ride? You know, th those sorts of things we do speak about at length. Um, and you're absolutely right to um, push back, I think, on them to say, okay, let's think about it from the dog's point of view. Um, you know, just because there's le you can legally do it, how's your dog going to respond to that? Do you want your dog to be comfortable and be able to work seven, eight, nine years? Or do you want to risk it getting so distracted by food because you're taking it into environments that they're so tempting for the dog to have food and die for food, you risk the dog having to be retired early because of food distraction. So it's it, this is what I mean at the beginning of this presentation, part of our job as educators of young folk is helping them project into situations they may not even have been in yet. And um, to understand it's a huge decision and they're the primary, they're the responsible party when it comes to the dog's welfare in all situations. Really, really feeling all of these readiness factors weaving themselves together too. And really from our end as teachers to really understand how they weave together so we can help guide our kids. Um, there's a couple, there's a, there's a quick one. Uh, somebody asking for you to repeat the name of the Canadian organization that you mentioned earlier. Sure. Uh, it's it's MIRA, which is spelled M-I-R-A Foundation. And I think it's MIRA Guide Dog Foundation. And it's in Quebec in Canada. I'm just going to shut my curtain. You can see light is starting to come in my room here. So just, just one sec. No problem. We had one more question from the chat earlier. Uh, there it is. Uh, what does Guide Dogs for the Blind recommend for a handler considering keeping a senior or retired dog along with a working dog? If possible, what can that lifestyle look like? Yeah, another great question. Well, firstly, our policy is that it's up to the handler if they would like to adopt their guide dog as a retired dog and it just becomes a pet. Uh, that's fine. They can also place the dog with an immediate family member, a friend, a neighbor, or they can return the dog to us and we'll offer it to the puppy raiser, or we've got plenty of people lined up to take a retired guide dog. There's no problem with that. So what does it look like, though, if the person decides to keep their dog? Well, what's really important is they've got to have a support system in place. It really isn't easy or a good idea if a person lives by themselves to try and care for a retired guide dog and go out and work a brand new dog. 
these dogs are so used to being with people and of course so used to being with their handler you know all the time that if all of a sudden the guide dog's retired and finds itself alone at home in a in a person's apartment or something it's it's not going to do well it's not used to that and it's obviously not a really good life um so what we tend to advise is that if there is someone who can kind of take over the responsibilities of the re of looking after the retired dog that, that a transition takes place so when the uh, older dog the retired dog starts to approach retirement maybe someone has picked a particular day a month whatever it might be that maybe the person is going to kind of be the the adopter the adoptive father or mum you know to this dog they start feeding the dog they start relieving doing a bit of exercise walk around the block or any sort of those tasks so the dog starts to move over a little bit gradually you know not just all at once uh, and then with the older dog's needs met in the household then the person can go the blind person can go and get a new dog and when they bring that new dog home they can concentrate 100 percent on getting that new dog established and not feel guilt-ridden that they're ignoring the older dog and also the older dog is going to be used to the fact that they've been spending less time with their handler so it doesn't come across as like complete abandonment um, so it's it's a very careful process we also incorporate into their uh, counseling with our client support specialist who is a very experienced guide dog handler as well as being a counselor and visually impaired so a lot of um, you know work goes into getting a person ready for that decision for many people the decision is great they have a lot of support it's a it's a happy decision that the dog can remain with the family but where it gets tricky is as i said they don't have anyone else to help or there is a legal problem and that can be that when the dog retires it loses its service dog access rights so if someone's living in an apartment complex for example that might be a no dog or no pet policy then it can get tricky because the dog does the guide dog is not a guide dog anymore but there still might be room if uh, the landlord is okay they've known the dog for years and they know it's a really good dog and it's a guide dog they might make an exception or the person um, can maybe decide to try and talk to their landlord well look this dog is really also my emotional support dog i mean he, i'd be devastated if i lost this dog he, he or she provides me with so much help and support so emotional support animals or dogs are allowed into rental accommodation but there has to be a what they call a nexus established between the dog providing that emotional support and the the uh the handler or owner so really good question and a very individual decision i think for each guide dog handler to make i think that wraps up our current list of questions in the uh in the chat how are we going for time adrian um it, it's uh we're, we're approaching that hour mark um but you know we come to this each week it's kind of up to you uh people of course some people would jump off if you if you continue past 4 30 um, but if you're willing to, uh, we'll end up putting this on YouTube. So I think it becomes a wonderful resource if you'd like to finish. Yeah, we're almost there. So I just wanted to check and yep, almost there. So this one, is the client aware and have they considered the increase in public attention? So for a young person, once again, uh, this is huge. Guide dogs are like magnets. They attract the public. and in many ways that can be really great it can be a social icebreaker uh, a lot of people with uh, blindness and visual impairment love this aspect that it allows people to come up to them and talk to them and you know can, they can make uh, relationships through it we've even had people meet their spouse care of their guide dog which is you know true stories but for a young person how are they going to handle it uh, are they aware that they're going to get much more attention are they mature enough to know that well you have to say something if someone's going to reach out and pet the dog you have to say no please don't pet my dog it's working for example um as i said earlier someone trying to give the dog a treat piece of food because the guide dog's just so cute you know once again they have to have that understanding this is a rare one but has happened before not all people like the increase in attention and when we compare the guide dog mobility to long cane mobility I have had a couple of people in my career 
choose to go back to the long cane because they were quite introverted people and they did, just wanted to be left alone. They just were, wanted to take the bus and just be left alone. They didn't want to be talking to, to strangers and all that stuff. With the cane, pretty rare that someone will jump up and say, what a beautiful cane, where did you get it? I've got one just like it. You know, that's, so I, I speak in jest, but it, it really is an individual choice. Most people who want guide dogs want this part of the deal as well. But once again, don't need to be a guide dog instructor, an O&M specialist, a blind rehab person to talk about this. This is just sort of a very understandable part of having a guide dog, but definitely one that a young person should be thinking about. Even to the point, put them in an environment like, how are you going to feel we're at school or maybe going to you know, your freshman year at college and you're on your way to your lecture or your class and you're stopped, you're running late and you're stopped by someone saying, hey, what a beautiful dog, could I talk to you about that? You're going to have to have a response which is appropriate and not be rude and also be a good representative of not just your guide dog organization that you got your dog from, but the whole guide dog community. You're a constant ambassador when it comes to guide dogs. So you're going to have to have a response like, thank you so much for your interest. I don't want to be rude, but I am running late for, you know, for my class, whatever it might be. Um, I got my dog from guide dogs for the blind, wherever it is feel free to call them for more information, something like that, right? So some mature response, because this is going to happen. And that was the last one, in fact. Good, there we go. We got it. We had another question come in uh, in the chat. What if a dog should be retired because of misuse or mistreatment by the handler? Okay, so um, first thing to know is if there is a situation that uh, that occurs, it hasn't occurred before a huge investigation. Um, the way that we would respond to it at Guide Dogs for the Blind is if there is a credible report from a member of the public or family or something like this, that uh, a guide dog is being abused or mistreated or neglected, then we always believe in giving the client the right of reply. So we would get that. We would also check out whether the complaint is genuine. So, you know, we'd ask people, look, we'll keep this confidential, but we do need your name and phone number. We'd like to contact you to follow up and let you know what's happening with this investigation. If they say, oh, no, no, I'm not prepared to give that. Well, then, you know, if they're not prepared to stand by their accusation, you know, we're going to question the, the legitimacy of it. I mean, unfortunately, there are people out there who will make, uh, make false reports to uh, get back at somebody, you know, in a, in a, you know, to have retribution, which is really sad, but it has happened. So let's just say it's a genuine, credible report. We're then going to call the client. And we'll be very neutral and we'll say, hey, listen, Mr. Smith, actually I shouldn't use Mr. Smith. We've got Angela here, Mr. Jones. <laughs> so just Mr. Jones, it's Mark from Guide Dogs. Um, look, this is a difficult call for me to make, but I wanted to bring to your attention that we've received a credible report that yesterday, on the corner of X Street and Y Avenue, you were allegedly uh, using your leash really harshly with your dog, lifting it off the ground. Its two front paws are in the air. So we're going to get details, very specific time of day, where it occurred, what occurred. And we're going to say, so, look, what's your take on that? What do you have to say about that? What do you think? Now, if it is that we also have a history that that's not the first time, then obviously we put a case together. And, um, you know, it is rare, but if it is that we determine something is genuine and credible, then we have a user contract, which someone signs, which they have to abide by, even if they take ownership of the dog, where we may have no choice but to repossess the dog. But as I said, it's extremely rare. Part of the reason it doesn't happen much is that unlike some guide dog schools, we have a system of follow up and support. So we're always, you know, offering a yearly visit to a team to go out and assess their work and the dog's condition. We have a support centre and a toll-free 800 number where people can call up if they're having problems. And we, we do really understand that sometimes, even if people do the wrong thing, like they give a too harsh correction or they yell at their dog, then we investigate what's going on with the person's life. So maybe they've just gone through a messy divorce or they've gone, they've lost their job and, you know, yes, they've done the wrong thing and they've yelled at their dog or given a harsh leash correction, 
well, we're not going to go in there and remove the dog just because we feel it's the right thing to do. We're going to help the person. Well, look, that's inappropriate, but it seems to me the major issue here is that you're under a lot of stress. What can we do to you know, advise you or recommend going and getting some counselling or something like that? So it's not a decision taken lightly and we have the person and the dog's interests in our decision. I'm continually impressed in every interaction I have with anyone from Guide Dogs um, for the Blind of how whole you are in the support of the dogs and the and your clients. Um, it's a it's this complete circle from beginning to end of supporting that relationship and um, it's neat. It's fantastic to watch. Thank you. It's you know it is that. Um, that's what I said before the presentation started. Again, thank you for inviting us to participate in this because you can see now, you know, guide dogs are very connected to the community, but also we do look holistically at the individual. It's not just a, you know, dog first mentality. Um, you know, the more we evolve as an organization, you know, the more we start to add additional professionals, like for example, Angela is an O&M specialist coming and joining us. Um, even our review committee, it's worth me saying, we have an admissions review committee that decide on people's candidacy for a dog it's not just a single person decision and that committee is made up of some pretty esteemed individuals and just real quick we have two of our vice presidents of training operations who are o m specialists and guide dog instructors so dual certified like me we have our uh, vice president of outreach and admissions and the o m program and our alumni program she is visually impaired a guide dog user and has a master's in blind rehab we have a uh, director of client services who is a uh, social worker, masters of social work. Uh, we have an, our registered nurse and we have one of our graduates who has a counseling background. So um, to name just a few, there are a few other people as well. So that gives you an idea. We're looking at a multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary rehab team to make these decisions and support clients both before and after training, as well, obviously, as in class. Fantastic. Um, uh, and to to my knowledge, you guys have the campus here in California and you also have a campus in Oregon, correct? That's correct. Just outside Portland. Yep. That's fantastic. And I, I, I get a question for myself as I see the and you guys all have the ability to unmute or put a question in your chat. Um, I always want to ask, uh, why is it called Juno? And I never remember. And I always Google search and then I forget to ask. And guiding guiding eyes says that it's because of Juno was the patron Roman goddess protecting travelers, but I go uh, look up Juno and she's she's the goddess of love and marriage. And now I'm sitting here being like, they could both work. What What is it, Mark? I have heard that uh, Juno, definitely the Roman goddess of marriage and matchmaking actually as well, and protector of the state. I'll take it. <laughs> so yeah. It, it's a great question and uh it's actually unique to uh the united states um oh. over in australia and uk and other countries we're very boring and we just say let's go and do a harness walk <laughs> <laughs> well there you go we went we went fancy i think summer's ready with a question no put her on the spot uh anybody else with a question or comment um Maybe not, as they're thinking, can I can I put in a plug for Jane? Because I wanted to give some information from, from Jane here. Not to absolutely. not to forget that we with Jane and her role with youth outreach, um, she's putting together a wonderful program for youth called Ready Set Forward. And uh, she wanted me to give a plug for their workshop series, uh, which concentrates on you know preparing youth for a guide dog and their families. And um, I know that she sent you, Adrian, the link to those. So um, feel free, have a look at those. And if you have uh, students there or family uh, that you think could benefit, by all means, uh, direct them to that resource or call Jane. Um, and we're only too happy to help. Angela, did you have anything to add yourself about that or anything else that you might think would be valuable right now? I, not that I can think of. It was a, a great presentation and I appreciate it. And if anyone has any direct referrals, they can send them my way because I process the applications for OMI. 
Awesome. Yeah, I haven't Great. spoken about that too much yet. The, the the program that Angela and I, you know, represent here, the Orientation to Mobility Immersion Program, and you know, really, really quick, it's a program that we implemented in 2016 to help folks get more, or, or in some cases, they haven't been able to get O&M services in other states, uh, to equip them with O&M skills that relate to guide dog travel. Um, so there is a video on our website called Developing Travel Skills for Guide Dog Mobility. It's actually in the O&M professional section. And uh, take a look at that because it really goes through like a sequential program that we offer, you know, with non-tactile skills. So a lot of moving through space, you know, hearing, uh, parallel perpendicular alignment, intersection analysis, time distance estimation skills, and of course, a lot of Juno work as well as cane work. Um, so it's almost like a bridge between the long cane and guide dog mobility. We can't train minors right now, but certainly transition age youth, we have a wait list right now due to the pandemic. So if they are 17 and they're interested, they can definitely apply, but we couldn't train them until they turned 18. Hello. Hello. My name is Puato. I'm a TVI and I was actually interested in getting a guide dog for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm itinerant and I travel to a lot of areas in the Bay, in the Bay Area, a lot of districts. And I was wondering if there's been any concerns with uh, TVI, itinerant TVIs and uh, students with allergies or being able to actually bring the dog with them into the classroom or um, if you've heard anything or if there's any, um, you know, uh, recommendations for a TBI like myself going to, to a variety of school districts. Thank you for your question. And um... I'll reference a study that was done on this by uh, a registered nurse, I think it was around 2002, if I remember. And the, the percentage of people with uh, medically recognized genuine allergies, it's about 15% of the population. So, you know, it's very rare that someone actually has a condition that would qualify, you know, as being a disability under the definition of disability. Um, so just on that alone, it's something I haven't really heard about. But as I said, even if that was the case, um, that you had a teacher or a student or a staff member at a school that you visited that had that um, defined disability when it comes to allergies, your rights as a guide dog user are the same. You couldn't be you know, banned from going to the school or something like that. They would have to find accommodations for you both. So, you know, that's that's how it is under the law. Um, so I would not let that preclude you. And I think as Adrian said earlier, and I've, I've really kind of pushed, communication is key. I mean, you're going to know, they're going to know what day of the week and time of the day that you're traveling to a school or classroom. So it's all there to be able to be negotiated. So the person with the credible medically defined allergy is accommodated and they're not put at any risk. What an Thank opportunity you. too. We have dogs, we have ambassador dogs on our campus and we have kids who don't like dogs on our campus. We have kids who are uncomfortable and unfamiliar with them. Um, we have staff who have allergies um, and we're able to just accommodate with that knowledge. And for the kids who are uncomfortable and don't like dogs, um, having a role model and your teacher comfortable with one and slowly introduce one has really been amazing because uh, at least in the Bay Area, it's tough not to like dogs. Um, it's a tough, that's a tough task because you're around them a lot. And so we've found having them on our campus makes life a little bit better for everybody. Yes, definitely more positives than negatives, that's for sure. And I think most, you know, most barriers can be overcome. Uh, that's my experience. There just has to be willingness on both sides to, you know, to reach a amicable compromise. I, there's a there's a comment in here about a, a bunch of thank yous. Uh, you guys have been outstanding. There's a comment in here about being um, a guide dog puppy raiser, and uh, and I got there was a question earlier about um, having an ambassador dog. Um, this is a crew of of a lot of TVIs and some O&Mers. 
who are curious about both those options. I'll start with the ambassador dog uh, one first. Um, we are always looking for ways to better utilize our all our dogs, but clearly not all of our dogs make it as guide dogs or breeder dogs. Uh, our success rate is a little bit over 50%, um, which might surprise you. You'll see behind me actually in my background, that's the new Guide Dogs for the Blind Puppy Center. And that's just opened uh, a year or two, one year ago actually. Um, and you know, it's purpose built to try and increase that percentage of dogs making it to guide dog status. Um, so why I mentioned it is back to the ambassador dog. That is a program that we're wanting to expand because it's a better use of one of our dogs that's career changed. It's not able to become a guide dog and just offering it back to the puppy raiser for a pet or to the general public. If we can use that dog in some capacity, that's that's part of our mission. So where ambassador dogs are really well used is definitely people who are in blindness agencies. Um, and certainly, um, for example, there's an OMNIM specialist uh, who just got an ambassador dog. Some of you might know him, he's part of CAMS. That's Robert Amanyana, who's over at the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind. He just got a beautiful little black ambassador dog and the purpose of having it at the lighthouse, interacting with clients and staff and people visiting, um, so he brings it to work with him each day. I know there obviously have been some CSB staff with ambassador dogs and that's terrific. And I know that our dog placement manager, James Dress, is very keen on trying to create more of these ambassador dog partnerships. We have ambassador dogs in places like Ronald McDonald, Ronald McDonald House, um, providing support to families there with their kids undergoing medical treatment. So if you are interested, um, you can definitely get in touch with dog placement and speak to James Dress, D-R-E-S-S. -S. He's the dog placement manager. There might be an online application. I'm, don't quote me on that, but definitely worth checking. Uh, but you'll, anyway, you'll end up talking with James. Um, so the idea there would be the dog is, is yours. You care for the dog, goes home with you, and you know it's effectively a pet. But it's it's got to have a purpose and be an ambassador for you know, not only guide dogs for the blind, but just guide dog mobility in general. Um, so the other part of the question was puppy raising. That's a little more complicated. Um, having a dog or puppy in a school setting, it ain't easy. Um, and we have a pretty strict assessment process um, about puppy raising and what's involved. I think there's a certain number of hours that you need to be at home. Um, also, the puppy can't be left alone, obviously, for uh, for long at all. Uh, managing a eight week old puppy in a school setting can be really challenging. That's when that, that's when they go into their homes. But if you do want to apply and see if you'd be eligible, once again, you can apply to be a puppy raiser. We're always after puppy raisers. There's no problem with that. Uh, but it is a big job, a lot of time. And um, so I would just apply through the normal channels on the website and uh, you'll end up talking to a puppy raising representative. Um, I think there was one more thing I thought of, it's just gone. It'll come back maybe. Now I slipped my mind, Adrian. <laughs> hey, hi, you man, if one thing slipped your mind, we got a hundred others to fill in for awesomeness. We, this was fantastic. Um, I think, uh, this is, this is exactly what we're looking for. This wonderful opportunity to hear it here and have people have questions, but also have this be able to post out on YouTube and people to be able to gain access to this. And I and thought that. of it. I thought of it. Thank you for giving oh, me a few nothing seconds. Nothing goes unclaimed. See, Angela, <laughs> this is how it rolls. This is the shoes you have to fill. <laughs> That's the Canine Buddy program. And so if it is that there are young people, um, children included, you know, that would like to have a companion um, that maybe one day not compulsory, but maybe one day could go on to getting a guide dog, but they're a little too young. Then we have a program called a canine buddy program. And these are really high quality dogs that have been released, just like the ambassador dog kind of uh, standard of dog. Um, and they've had a lot of training already put into them through the guide dog training program. 
and uh, they go out to families with children with visual impairment. They make wonderful companions. They um, do so much for the child and their family. And I think one thing I can say to attest to that, can you imagine the role of a canine buddy right now with the distance learning and social isolation that has been going on with the pandemic? for you know, a kid with a disability, for example, and just anyone in general, the importance of, of pet therapy and companionship. It's so huge right now to the point that I've heard you're, it's, you're hard pressed to find a shelter dog in some places right now um, because people have just been so in need of companionship, being locked up at home and away from their friends and their workplace, all that sort of stuff. So canine buddies have been filling a really important role right now. Uh, if you have a child or a family who might be interested in that, once again, you can apply through the website, but James Dress is the man for canine buddies. So they're free of charge. There's no cost. We see them as just as important as a guide dog. So uh, these are provided free to, to families. We've known a slew of kids with canine buddies over the years, and they're so important for so many ways. And we use our we use some of our ambassador dogs on campus in a similar fashion of getting kids oriented to a dog. And every once in a while, I get somebody realizing, whoa, I'm not ready for this. Yeah. I will reevaluate when I'm much older. Um, but what we also see is uh, a lot of kids, a lot of our dogs at home are not a dog example for what a guide dog could be. <laughs> and so the canine buddy program gives you a, a relatively well-trained dog, right? <laughs> but, oh, very much but so. It's not, yeah. not a dog coming out of my house, uh, which would be a terrible example of of what you would use for a guide dog down the road. So it's setting that stage appropriately, which is a neat program. And it gives the dog, uh, the dog obviously has a loving home and it's so wonderful that they're filling a purpose because these dogs are bred for a purpose and there's no, no more noble purpose for a dog that, you know, being a companion to a kid with a vision impairment because it results in higher self-esteem levels, increased social awareness and communication. And back to the readiness, checklist for a brief second here a, a child who has a visual impairment actually being in charge of something else for a change not being told what to do all the time where you can go keep safe you know all this sort of restrictions that are sometimes imposed or imagined by by a young person who is blind so actually learning to be in charge of a dog looking after the dog you know the feeding the grooming the relieving all that sort of stuff it really does build a lot of confidence and responsibility and i know that the stories we get from parents uh, they they're just so emotional how they see their child change for the better um the way they think of themselves and uh it's just yeah so i can't say enough about the canine buddy program I'm glad you guys have had some experience with that <laughs> 